And it looks like we're live. So, Dr. Robin Collins, thank you uh, very much for coming on my show and being willing to talk with me. Uh, you are considered one of the most foremost experts on the fine-tuning argument. So could you tell me a little bit more about what is the fine-tuning argument and why does it indicate a god as opposed to unknown natural causes? Okay, so the fine-tuning argument um, is based on the – starts with the so-called fine-tuning of the cosmos – um, for the existence of life, and I think the relevant kind of life is what I call embodied conscious agents. And basically, the fine-tuning evidence is that the universe has to be structured in extremely, extremely precise ways in order for um, life to exist. And so the idea is, is that this is very unlikely or very epistemically improbable under just the atheist or the naturalistic single universe hypothesis, the idea that they're just a single universe and um, that's it, but not improbable under theism. So by the rule, the what's called the likelihood principle is that um, evidence supports the hypothesis under which it's least, um, it's the least unlikely or the most probable, it supports theism over the naturalistic single universe hypothesis. That's one way of cashing out the argument. So given all of the possible combinations of constants, the way that could be, life is only possible on a very small spectrum of those. And very small spectrum, right. And you'd say that that's indicative of a designer as opposed to just being like, for example, Stephen Hawking argued that uh, maybe the constants are determined by other laws we haven't discovered yet. So this could be, the fine tuning could be explained by natural explanations and doesn't indicate a designer. So why does this indicate a designer? So you could go to uh, a deeper theory idea. Let's suppose there's a deeper theory like what they used to hope string theory would do is that the laws of that theory would fix the um, parameters just to what they are that permit life. But that would just kick the problem back one level. Why would the laws be such that they would specify those exact values that allow for life versus the huge number proportion of other values that do not allow for life? So then it there's a it would just kick back the fine tuning to the level of the laws themselves. Why are they so spe why are they such they give rise to these particular life permitting values versus the vast the um, overwhelming majority of values that do not allow for life. Well, doesn't God also need to be fine-tuned to make a universe exactly like ours? He has to have some particular nature why he would pick this universe as opposed to all the others a God could potentially great, create. So who designed the designer, or how does God solve that problem? Okay, I don't think the designer... Um, need, I don't think the question really applies to God. When you And now we'll give another analogy. Let's suppose you have like a... Um, ink marks on a paper that form the picture of Abraham Lincoln, okay, or what looks like Abraham Lincoln. No one would think that was just simply um, <clears throat> a random ink spill. The reason is, is there, first of all, it's very, very unlikely to fall into that, simply that pattern by chance. And which means there's, there's the vast majority of other patterns don't have any um, special significance. Okay, and it's that pattern that has um, special significance. So it has both special significance and seems very improbable. There's a whole bunch of competitor patterns. And so that's when you infer, like in the case of somebody intentionally designed it. Now, in the case of, so what you see is that the question, what you want to do is pose the question for the case of God is, um, but that issue would only, God would only need design if there was something analogous to um, the case of, relevantly analogous to the case of the ink spill. But in the, so there would need to be, God would have to be composed of some components and be such that um, only one arrangement of those components would lead to a mind that would design a universe. Um, but God either is or is not. God is in the traditional conception of God. God's not composed of components. So there's nothing to fine tune or arrange is a simple answer. So there's just no fine tuning problem in the case of God. Well, can't I use that same argument and make a, a similar argument for a kind of naturalistic pantheism where there's just this necessary natural thing we haven't discovered yet, which isn't composed of parts where it's just the pure actuality kind of property? 
And so yeah, we and they, don't, and they don't want to have to have the property of, of picking out uh, a particular life permitting universe versus all the others. Then you'd have to explain why did it have the property of picking out a life permitting universe versus the slew of other universes. So in the case of theism, you do have an uh, answer for that. And that is um, the perfect goodness of God. So it's because God perceives some value in creating a universe like ours. It realized some special kind of value. Now, you might wonder, well, isn't it um, improbable that God would be good versus all the other attributes? Well, there's something special about the property of goodness. And I mean, this goes back to a thesis um, um, going back to Plato that to perceive recognizing something is good is intrinsically motivating. So the only, the explanation for like why somebody, if they recognize something is good and could do it, why wouldn't they do it? It's either because, or, or why don't people do the good things that they can do? It's either because um, they are ignorant of that a certain thing is good or because they have some kind of countervailing desire that's restricting them. So, you know, you might recognize, okay, killing somebody is wrong and you might still go and do it and it's not a good thing. And why would you do it? Well, you have some other desire, let's say to, you know, um, get their money or whatever. But in the case of God, um, if God's this sort of um, infinite being, um, there and his ultimate explanation, a foundational explanation, then God's not going to have um, any of those contrary desires. If God did, then you would have to have a set of laws or something that would determine, that would restrict God, and then you'd have a problem with the fine tuning of those laws, and God wouldn't be an ultimate explanation. So you could you could try to do it on a naturalistic account, but then you're going to have to add some sort of desire in there and you get all the fine tuning back again of why having that desire versus some other. Let me give another analogy for that. It's like, let's suppose you win the lottery, okay? And you could uh, hypothesize that the lottery commissioner rigged the lottery in your favor. But unless you had some relationship to the lottery commissioner, um, then it would be just, it would be, just as improbable that the lottery commission would rig it in your favor as that you would win it, the lottery by chance. So you've just transferred the improbability up to why would the lottery commissioner choose you versus all the other um, equally good alternative people. So you have to have the desire has to be non-arbitrary and goodness is the one um, a desire to do, which is good. The, the, it's because the property of good is at least plausibly thought to be self-motivating. It's a thesis that it, people that are weren't theists um, have proposed. Well, I don't see how that changes the theory at all. Because so God created the universe be the way it is because of His nature, and then God created the universe the way it is because of His nature to produce moral beings. Well, that's also still a part of His nature. So that seems like the same argument in both cases. I don't see how adding the moral nature uh, makes it more likely because it's that's also determined by God's nature. And I mean, if you did think that was a compelling argument, I could just do the same thing for pantheism and say, instead of pantheism created the universe the way it is because of pantheism's nature, pantheism created the universe uh, as the way it is because of pantheism's nature to produce highly unstable elements like astatine or something. And so, yeah, but you'd have to sit, you'd have to, you would have to make that nature non-arbitrary. So whatever the ultimate foundation is, you're talking about an ultimate foundation is pantheism or God or something else. Then why would it have that attribute versus some other? Well, but why, so, does God have, why is God non-arbitrary? How does God solve that problem? Well, because the good, the, the attribute, the thing that gives rise to the desire of goodness is not arbitrary because once you have God is omniscient, or has knowledge of what is good, then, and there isn't anything restricting God, other uh, contrary desire um, that is running contrary, um, that somehow restricts God, like we have desires, like sexual desires or desires for money or whatever, um, then it's not an arbitrary desire and no longer highly improbable. It'd be like having, um, so when you do this other, what you're doing is you're, you're saying it's pantheism plus this desire to create this particular universe versus uh, uh, um, all the other possibilities that aren't life permitting. 
And then you have to subscribe that special desire. It'd be like subscribing the desire to the lottery commissioner that they wanted to rig it in your favor versus all the others. So right. you would. All right. So, so God has this property in his nature, this moral property, which causes him to be determined to make our kind of universe as opposed to all the others he could make. And I'm saying that pantheism is equally determined because it also has a similar property, though it's not a moral property, it's just a different property, like the property to produce astatine or something. That's just the fundamental nature of what it is. So it still has an analogous comparison to God. It's just not the moral. Well, but then, no, but then, no, but then the thing is, is why does it, why have you pantheism with that nature versus some other nature? Now, if it was intrinsic to any form of pantheism to have that nature, then maybe you could get it as non-arbitrary. So um, let's say in pantheism, the idea is, you know, that the consciousness permeates everything, right? So I think that's what you're meaning, like pantheism, everything is conscious or is like mind-like. Is that what you mean by pantheism? Well, I'm going with specifically naturalistic pantheism, which is defined in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy as essentially just a form of naturalism, just an eternal, all-powerful naturalism. So an eternal, the, well, then it's not the pantheism means theism everywhere, God everywhere. So you're thinking of some eternal foundation. Um, I mean, otherwise it's just naturalism. Well, right. It's, this wasn't defined by me. I'm just going with the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. They define naturalistic pantheism as one of the three main branches of pantheism, which is a physicalistic branch uh, adopted by the Stoics. So the oh, Okay, so that is a... Okay, so I see what you're talking about. It's the kind of Stoic philosophers that mind and was permeating everything. Well, again, I'm going to lean just more towards the naturalism. We can just think of this as just an, a, an expansion of natural science with just nothing more than what science already adopts. Just did I wouldn't call it pantheism because that's not the Stoic. That's not Stoic philosophy. They had they stressed purpose in the world. Right. Again, I'm going with the definition from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So you can you can take that up with them if you don't like it. But let's just go with that for now. Okay. Well, you, I, I just take yours as being naturalism. So there's a naturalistic foundation. There's something else deeper than this physical universe that we see that gives rise to it. Right. So the question is, is that why can't uh, you assert that there's there's moral property which is intrinsic to a god? Why can't I equally assert there is this astatine property that is intrinsic to pantheism or my naturalistic pantheism? But, but then you've got the same um, improbability back again. Why that? property X that gives rise to a life permitting universe versus property Y, you know, X1, X2, or X0 that gives rise to a life permitting universe versus X1, X2, X3, X4, you know, on and on and out that would not give rise to the life permitting universe. So it's still very coincidental it, that that's the ultimate reality, that it has X0 as its fundamental property that gives rise to life permitting universe versus all the other ones. Whereas theism, it's not coincidental that it has the, the X zero being the moral property because the moral property is bound up with having a consciousness that um, is aware of moral truths. If you have a consciousness that's aware of moral truths and you're not restricted, you'll be motivated to bring those states of affairs that are good about. So you so, said that morality isn't arbitrary because it's linked up with this other property of consciousness. So can't I just say that pantheism has this acetine property, which is not arbitrary because it has some other property like consciousness, but just a different property? Well, you would have to make it plausible why consciousness, if let's say in pantheism, why it would be um, necess you uh, non-arbitrarily linked with this other property. Now, you could, of course, say that, but it wouldn't be... Um, very probable, just like you could say that there it was the um, there was some something about the um, the lottery commissioner that made him want to choose you. But why think that? Why among all the other ones? So it's still epistemically improbable. It's it, by which we mean it's um, it might be a, ne a necessary in and of itself, but it's still improbable. Um, which means that we should assign it a very low probability because there's all these other equal possible uh, um, alternatives. In other words, all these possibilities that from our own point of view are equally good. So like, it, I mean, given, given what I mean by this kind of probability is when you toss a coin or a die and it comes up six, 
um, it could all be determined. You could have lived in a deterministic universe and still have a one sixth of a probability of coming up six. So that probability of one six is just simply saying that we should have put very um, small rational degree of belief that it will come up six because there's six, there's five other equally good alternatives. So yes, I mean there could be this pan, this naturalistic. Um, existence that it's just part of its necessary nature that it gives rise to this. That could be true, but we should assign that just like in the case of uh, the um, uh, the die a very uh, uh, we should assign it a low probability because there's all these other equally good alternatives, and that would actually give rise to non-life permitting universes. From my perspective, I see your argument that morality is a necessary consequence of consciousness to be equally as arbitrary as for me saying there's like some Moogle property, which is the necessary consequence of the Astatine property. So it seems like there's just kind of equally as we can both equally assert these kind of necessary correlation between these asserted properties of this metaphysical explanation, but I don't see any reason to believe that they're true any more than the one I Well, proposed. but that that's because, well, I mean, I just say in defense of it is it's not arbitrarily selected that it has this, um, that being conscious of the good is motivates you to do the good. And, oh, oh, well, that's goes, that's partly, I mean, this is why people have adopted in the past medievals and Plato is that um, to say something is good is to say it, or it's intrinsically good is to say it's intrinsically desirable. In other words, it's um, to recognize it as good it is intrinsically self-motivating. So people have held that thesis independent of theism. So it's not just being made up to, you know, find this ultimate explanation. That has seemed like a plausible thesis about the good, that there's something special about moral properties. So when we say something is evil, that means, um, as like opposed to good, that it's, if you think, like, if you think or let's suppose you think this certain thing is good for you, okay? You think something is good for you. Well, if you think it's good for you, that's going to give you some motivation to bring it about. You said, well, it doesn't give me any motivation to bring it about. I think it's good for, it's good for me. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because if you think it's good, you think it's desirable for you. And if it's desirable, you want to bring it about. Now, you might not bring it about, so a lot of people... You know, they think staying off the bottle is good for me if they're an alcoholic, but they don't do it because they give in to temptation. But if they say it's, it's if, if they really believe it's good not to, you know, drink so much, then that's going to have some motivating power. There's an intrinsic connection between goodness and motivation. That's the idea. And it's a plausible thesis because it's not just made up to, you know, for the theists to get around the arbitrariness problem, because it's just been held by people apart from theism. Well, I definitely agree. From my perspective, it would be an evolutionary property that we see morality this way because of evolution. So I don't think it's necessarily a fundamental part of reality. But if it was a fundamental part of reality, I could just say it's also just an undiscovered law of nature grounded in pantheism without a mind. And it's just kind of like gravity and it affects our brains, causing us to pursue the good because it's just a fundamental part of reality, kind of like what Stoics did believe or what many people. Well, you could, you could say that. I mean, one could say that all I re all that's required here is that this property be plausible to ascribe to it. So maybe another analogy will help with, uh, with, uh, um, with a lottery commissioner. Maybe I don't know that you're, you're um, let's suppose you're related to the lottery commissioner. Now, you could say that that won't influence the lottery commissioner in choosing you, but it's at least a lot more plausible than it would have been otherwise. So it's probability, the prior probability that the lottery commissioner would choose you to win the lottery is now higher than just the chance. So it does actually confirm some that it was rigged in your favor if you were like the brother of the lottery commissioner. Now, it when you could deny that it had that influence, but it would now make it plausible. And that's all is needed here. I don't need to prove it. I just need to show that it's plausible because then it becomes not as improbable that God would have that desire as that there would exist a life-permitting universe. And that's all that's needed for the argument.
Well, I, I definitely understand the argument you're making, but it seems like I can make a corollary to a naturalistic pantheism to have every single aspect that you're arguing for at an equal level. Like I can say there's an undiscovered law of nature that's the moral law, and the moral law causes it to have this nature to produce astatine or life, if you wanted to. I could go with that too. So we can make the same argument from a designed explanation of fine-tuning as we could for a necessary uh, natural process that produces fine-tuning. So I don't see any reason why that would well, indicate... Go ahead. I, I don't think the natural process, you haven't established a link. Why uh, there is it like a natural moral um, law that says that um, the good needs to be brought about somehow? Well, I just I mean, say that could, that's definitely one of the possibilities I go with, but I just say the that's natural. That's the axiarchic principle. And I, 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 that's called the axiom. And John Leslie has pushed that a lot. And I'm sympathetic to that one. If you want to do without a God, go with the idea that um, somehow the good is, uh, he says, um, what ought to be is. So the, uh, the, the, there's a kind of moral obligatoriness brings, brings about things. And so then there is a non-arbitrary connection. You could say that's a fundamental part of reality. Others have, there's a couple other authors that have pursued that. And I was actually take it, very taken by it for um, a a couple of years um, as a real significant uh, alternative. Um, but I, and I think that goes nicely actually with theism anyhow. So for John Leslie, that it's the axiarchic principle that gives that it counts for the existence of God. Um, and somebody like Keith Ward thinks the same thing. So you could, you could do that. In that case, you would have a ar non-arbitrary connection, but that's what you need. So I, I wouldn't say you couldn't go that way, that way, but you need to explore that. So I would say more that the fine-tuning argument supports over the naturalistic single universe hypothesis, theism or something like it. And this is like you could have a fundamental teleological principle. And so then you'd have to explore how good of an alternative that was. Did it do as good of a job as theism? Well, how would you say that it does, that the theism would be better? What does it do better than the naturalistic explanation? Well, it's not purely naturalistic. It's bringing in a kind of moral and a creative moral imperative. It's not n usually what we goes under naturalism. So it's just kind of naturalism without a mind. I guess there's two, there's two kinds of approaches you could take there is you could take John Leslie's approach and, and many others that it'd be better for God to exist than not exist. So if God's logically possible, then the axiarchic principle itself would, if it is created, would give rise to a God because uh, existence of a God is it's a more valuable universe than not. Um, the other thing is that it's kind of hard to conceive of how um, we, like if you have to range many different parts together at very separate locations, it's um, like across the universe to get everything right for let's say life or something else. Um, it's hard to see how a principle would do that. And if the principle does that, it would somehow have to kind of in within its, it, the, it would have to take this component, this component and somehow evaluate all these different arrangements for their goodness, that is sounding a lot like a mind to me. So it, it sounds like when you start cashing it out, you have this unified thing under everything that has a valuative component. Um, it's sounding a lot like God to me now. Well, I, I would mean, describe it more like a whole that, sphere. What's that? I would describe it more like a Hoberman sphere where they're all interconnected and any change to one constant would cause a proportional change to all of the other constants. So they can't physically be different, kind of like a square if or a perfect triangle. If you try to move any of the vertices, all of the others are going to move with it because it can't change. So I would say that that could be a potential natural explanation. Well, that, then you're invoking, if it can't change, you're invoking a necessity. Of necessity, it has to be arranged this way. Right, exactly. I'm saying that we can explain the fine-tuning as a result of some necessary uh, other laws that are intrinsic to this pantheism thing. So it's just- So you, yeah, you could do it um, by um, necessity, but it doesn't really get around the argument because it's like, um, then if you, if you allow yourself to do that, just invent a necessity, um, you could say something like this. So a coin, uh, or I go to um, Deadsville, Nevada, and I'm playing the roulette wheel and every single time, I mean, 36 times in a row, the house wins. 
it's really improbable. It's like one in a hundred chance each time. I'm sure they rigged it. So I go up to the house manager. He's been he's been talking to you, Tom. <laughs> and so now he says, "Oh, it's just a necessary. You don't have to appeal to rigging or anything like that. It's a necessary part of the universe." Um, I adopt a form of pantheism such of necessity. This particular roulette wheel, um, because of the arrangement of all the particles at the beginning of the universe and the natural laws, is going to come up 36 times um, in a uh, row so that we happen to win. Now, if you buy that explanation, I want to play you a game uh, <laughs> where we can do some betting in the future. <laughs> Well, I would use a different analogy. I would think of it like 3,000 years ago when we didn't understand lightning and we saw a lightning strike go from the sky and hit this one guy in the middle of a field. You know, that seems really improbable. That seems like the 36 uh, roulette wheels of the house winning. Like that, that must be, there's something going on there. So I can think, well, maybe the lightning was created by this guy named Zeus. But then we can learn more about nature and we discover if we learn about the laws of electromagnetism that the guy in the middle of the field where there's no other trees around is holding a giant iron sword which attracts electricity and electricity just went to the simplest path. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, Zeus at all. It wasn't designed. It was just that's how nature works. Yeah, I mean, so that's how nature works. We already have uh, uh, just within in, – we have independent reasons for thinking that if somebody has a sword in their hand – that's going to happen, and so true that you wouldn't you wouldn't want to invoke um, Zeus for that. But I think you'd have a hard time getting a probabilistic argument going there, um, even to begin with. Like if there was only one person, if you only had one person, and they didn't have let's say the sword and the lightning bolt hit that one person, there was never any lightning ever before or after. Then I think you would have evidence in support of Zeus and like that person. Okay, if if Zeus had if there was a connection between what that person did and let's say the Holy Scriptures about Zeus and what that person did was bad and forbidden by the Holy Scripture, he walks out in the field and the lightning bolt hits, um, I would be I would be quite reluctant to disobey the scriptures of Zeus if I saw that happening. So I do think there would be um, evidence. I think the reason it wouldn't normally count is if there's enough people, it's just it those things happen by chance. And there's no reason to think that Zeus would do it to that particular person versus all the other, just like you don't have any reason to think you would, uh, the person would rig the lottery in favor of you versus any other person. So you've retransferred the improbability around. Right. So if we lived like 3000 years ago and we didn't understand lightning, we rarely saw it. And this was like the first lightning bolt we saw and it came from the sky and hit this one guy and we could, uh, post hoc look at all the things he did and find one thing you know that that thing looks really immoral we don't like that thing so that's probably why he got hit by the lightning yeah if you do that post hoc but you would have to if this was the let's say the person that disobeyed if because um if you do it if he was the only one that disobeyed the scripts holy scriptures of zeus um then you would have a case to be made but what you would find as you looked into it more, there'd be many others that disobeyed the holy in minor ways, in equivalent ways, the holy scriptures of Zeus. So now you've got the improbability. Why did he pick out that particular individual? Let's say, you know, um, uh, uh, Hor um, Horatio's um, jump, let's say it was one of your ancient ancestors. Why did he pick out that who dis was an atheist and picked uh, atheist, a Zeus atheist and disobeyed the Holy Scripture versus all the other Zeus atheists? So then you would have this, it's the improbability back again. But if he was the only one, there was all this group of a million people and they investigated thoroughly and only he was the only one that disobeyed one of the laws. Then I think, yeah, I would be taken aback. I'd be reluctant now to disobey um, uh, law of Zeus. And I right. think you would probably be too. Absolutely. But that's the argument that Sean Carroll makes where he says that we can't really make a comparison here because we only have one universe. We have a sample size of one. We don't have all those other universes to say, well, it hasn't happened here to say like your example of, well, maybe there's all these other people who it hasn't happened to that we can eliminate to increase the probability of this being a very particular event. We only have this one isolated example. So we can't really say one way or the other. Well, we could still say we could, could say it's, there's all these conceptual other possibilities. Like if you see that, um, if you had a trillion-sided die, and you rolled it, 
and it came up on your favorite number, and and you were claiming you had, let's say your favorite number was some arbitrary, you know, a million, one, one million, well, let's say what a billion, five hundred and thirty-six million, and something, string it out, okay? So it's your favorite number, and you were going around claiming, I have these great powers, and. So I roll the die and it comes up your favorite number. I'd be taking you more seriously. Absolutely. And even though it was only a single case, there was only a single case, a single die roll. I never rolled that die again. Once I roll, rolled it, it was a trillion sided die of equal sides. It just fell apart. And, and I knew it wasn't weighted ahead of time. So I could make that probability. It was equal, equal reason to believe any side of the die. It would be a single case. And yet, from a single case, I couldn't. I would still make that inference, and we do that all the time in science. I mean, the thing is, is that we had a single evolutionary history. We like when they, when they, um, the um, in continental drift theory, one of the big pieces of evidence in favor of it was that um, that the um, animal and plant life between um, a million or two years ago between South America and Africa were very similar to each other. And so the idea was, well, if the continents were together at some point in the past, that wouldn't be improbable at all. But if they, if they weren't ever together, that would be really an amazing coincidence. And it's only a single case we have to deal with. So we may, and, and so we, Scientists thought that supported continental drift very well over the other ones. And you can find all kinds of in instances in science that way. The Big Bangs only happen once. And yet, you know, the cosmic microwave background radiation, you infer that it was a, a major evidence for the Big Bang, even though it's only a singular instance. Why? Because you think it'd be very improbable that the radiation would have this, you know, um, be uh, black uh, have the spectrum of a black body radiation just by chance, even though somebody by a uh, Hoyle, Fred Hoyle tried to make up alternative explanations, but they were very arbitrary. He had all kinds of arbitrary adjustments of parameters. He was a steady state advocate and never really gave up the steady state theory along with his one of his students. So they were about doing the same thing, making up non-arbitrary or arbitrary postulates, much like the naturalistic pantheism, but the Big Bang theory, natu which was already proposed, you know, in the late 20s, first by a Belgian priest, already... Lamel, what's his name? Um, Lamatre. Lamatre, that's it. Yeah. So that already was there, and it naturally explained it. In fact, you know, people, before they discovered it, people at Princeton were already making those calculations. Um, so there you have a case of a single event that we judge is very improbable to happen, you know, by just the starlight all coming together in the right way, but not under this other hypothesis. And you could still generate a hypothesis of where it's going to happen by adjusting, having all kinds of parameters you adjust, but then it's, it's all arbitrary. So we prefer the Big Bang Theory and consider it great evidence. So I think there's a good example that meets quite a bit of your objections. Well, to use your example of the dice, so we only have one dice and we see it roll and I predict this number and it came out this number. I mean, so it's more reasonable to assume that the dice is weighted than it is to assume that it just randomly pulled off this number. But it could be weighted by design or it could be weighted because the dice was just naturally heavier on one side. But okay, so let's suppose you say this is my favorite number, and I have these powers, and the dice, the die was produced independently of you, and we don't know it could have been weighted, right? So we don't know which number is weighted. It would still, if it landed on that your favorite number, it would still be one in a trillion chance whether it was weighted or not. If it was weighted. The, if it was not weighted, then it would be just one in a trillion because you equally, physically equally probable come up on each side. If it was weighted, then the probability just kicked back one level. Uh, it's a one in a trillion chance that it's weighted on your favorite number versus all the other ways it could have been weighted in that factory. So it's very improbable under the hypothesis that Tom Jump is not some sort of godlike being, but not improbable other that he is some sort of godlike being that has these supernatural powers. And so it confirms the Tom Jump godlike being hypothesis over its um, 
contrary. Now, I still wouldn't believe you're a godlike being because I would weight the probability of that initially very, very low, but I would grant that it offered really good evidence. I take you more seriously. Right. If I could predict it, but we didn't predict it. We posted it. We looked at the evidence after we existed in it. So like the dice was rolled and we existed in the number it landed on. And then we decided this was our favorite number after it rolled because we existed here. Yeah, but I don't think that's, I mean, there is that thing. It's a post-diction. So, and that's going to always happen with the fine tuning argument because we already know we um, exist before even examining the evidence. So that's true. But I don't think um, that should um, make a difference. Like when Einstein developed his theory of general relativity, it was already known that um, about the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. And yet I think it still counted just as much in uh, favor of his theory as if he, um, and I, that was the first article I ever published in a philosophy journal arguing for the, there's no special epistemic value for prediction over accommodation. So his theory would accommodate the data, but it accommodated it in a natural way. And that's what counts. It was still very improbable for that procession to happen under Newtonian theory of just the amount this particular amount, but not under Einstein's theory. And it wasn't an arbitrary adjustment of Einstein's theory. It kind of naturally came out of his con his general relativistic construct. And if he had predicted it before or after, I don't think there would be any special epistemic value. And I think we're kind of, um, we, we are um, like, um, we are sort of taken in by the, the novel prediction, but I don't think we should be. And I think there's probably examples you could come up with science where you get the post diction. We still find it very um, believable. That's, you know, that's one of the examples. I actually had a conversation with Luke Barnes about this and he sent me a link to a book. I don't, I think talking about this and it said that one of the reasons that the retrodiction of mercury was so impressive was because they couldn't really measure the measure it as accurately until later and when they could measure it accurately they realized that his prediction was was actually a, a future prediction in the sense that it predicted it more accurately than they could measure it but to, to go back to your point i would say but that it doesn't really it shouldn't even make a difference if it was a future prediction i mean you might have um he um his theory might have future predicted it let's suppose it but then for later people who already knew about general relativity so you learned about the precession first of, and then you learn about general relativity, it still should have, even if you didn't know the history of Einstein, that he future predicted it, it still should support it just as much. Well, I actually prefer future predictions because I think you can use ad hoc and post hoc reasoning to make any uh, like past explanation we already know make it fit into your explanation. For example, New Newton tried to explain the retrodiction by saying there was this other body causing it. So you can always use post hoc and ad hoc reasoning to make anything we currently know fit your model, which is why I think that we should prefer future predictions as more supportive of the, your explanation being correct. Well, actually, it's all the, the futurity of a prediction um, indicates something about how ad hoc the hypothesis or whether it's simple or not, because there is that problem, humans can do that. But if you could analyze how natural it flows from the problem, then it shouldn't make a difference. But the reason it makes a difference is it's if it's been a future prediction, then we can be assured that somebody just didn't manipulate things to make it look that way. Is there some kind of criteria to establish what that means? Like what is a natural consequence of the theory as opposed to? Well, I mean, that's the idea of a simplicity of a theory or is um, it goes back to um, um, William Hewell, the consilience of inductions, which was kind of made... Um, more famous by um, one of the, uh, blinking on his name, uh, biologist, you might remember his name, but he was an evolutionary biologist who talked about that. So it's the consilience of induction idea is, let's suppose you have a theory that explains one thing over here, but it also explains another thing naturally. So um, if you if you construct the theory to explain the end of, to say to explain things A, but then you find out it explains things B, then you know it wasn't just simply manipulated to explain B because it'd be very coincidental for it <clears throat> that you construct to explain A would explain B, so it explains independent things. So that's the idea. Is then it um, 
if it explains independent things like that, the very things you need to explain A and ends up explaining B, um, then that's an indication of naturalness of the theory. Right. I would kind of count that as more like a future prediction because it's not something you know at the time. It's you would make predictions of your model and then you discover something you didn't know in the future that conforms with your model. So I would still kind of count that as a future prediction. I wouldn't necessarily because you could you could have the two pieces of data you know and you say, well, um, this is, and you could look at the parameters and you could see the parameters were fixed. They, this one chunk of data fixed the parameters in such a way that in order to explain chunk A, even though you were aware of chunk B, you could see that it had, um, it, um, it, it also explained chunk B. But what, I mean, you could consider that a future prediction. The requirement really is, is that you don't adjust things arbitrarily to make the expl explanation work out. And that's the point I was stressing in the case of the um, attribute of God's desires. You can't just adjust them because anybody can do that to make it explain the data. There has to be independent reasons for thinking that, let's say, a being like God who had knowledge and power would have that kind of desire. And that's what I was offering. There's at least a plausible independent reason. Well, so it's two things there. One is that why is, so God has this necessary property of who he is, which was his, his omniscience, consciousness, and his morality, which determines him to make our kind of a universe. No, but the, the, what you get is you get the omniscience and being like perfect. Swinburne talks about it being perfectly free. God's not restrained on anything else. That itself gives you the property of goodness because God recognizes what is good. And if you recognize what is good, you will do it unless you have a constraining desire. So, so isn't God determined by that perfect freedom and his morality to necessarily make this kind of universe just like... No, no, necessarily um, create things with value, but there could be other universes with value, different kinds of universes. So all it has to be... I mean, it's like an artwork. When you explain an artwork or like the picture of Abraham Lincoln, you don't have to say the person had a desire that necessitated them to do that or guaranteed they would do that. It's just the desire, it, there's enough motivation to make it a lot less like, more likely than that it happened by chance. That's all you need. So um, the person might have constructed a picture of um, George Washington or you know, Robin Collins or any innumerable other things or no picture at all. But it's just simply a lot more probable than the chance. That's why, like, if you found, you know, if you found a building on Mars that looked like it served a purpose, right, had aqueducts and things going like that in it, you'd think that was evidence that for extraterrestrial life at some point in the past um, or other kinds of things that looked like artwork that would seem very improbable to happen um, by chance because it's not improb it's not nearly as improbable under the design hypothesis. That's why, you know, when the, apparently when the Allies invaded Germany, they found all kinds of things that looked like machines, but they didn't know quite what their purpose was. And so it, it was just a lot more likely that those would have been produced under the um, idea that it was a purpose hypothesis than the non-purpose one. That's all you need. So I would object to saying God would be of necessity have to create this universe. It's simply that this universe has, you can glimpse some value, some, and that gives a reason for God to create. If you couldn't glimpse any significant value that would distinguish it among all the other universes, it has to be a distinguishing value, then you wouldn't have an argument off the ground. Because any universe, you could say, well, any universe has some value to it, but it's not a distinguishing value. Right. Why? So God, so God has these properties of perfectly free and morality, and they determine him to make a universe with moral beings, which gives you a range of possibilities. No, they don't determine God. They they motivate God. They give a uh, they give God a reason to do it, but don't determine God. Okay. So can't I say the same thing going back to your example? I forget what, I forget what uh, you called it. It started with an A. But going back to the example of a naturalistic universe with this moral law, which causes it to create a certain range of universes or motivate it to create a certain range of universes, but instead of with uh, conscious motivation, it's like a quantum particle probability motivation kind of thing. So can't we yeah, match? But why, would, 
why would it be a motivation to create a, a life permitting universe versus all the other vast number of other universes? It's much like the lottery commissioner example. The lottery in the lottery commissioner example, if you were a relative, then that would give the lottery commissioner a reason to rig it in favor of you versus in favor of somebody else. So you, each of the people that win, could potentially win the lottery, they're universes. We just think of them that way. They're universes, right? So the lottery commissioner is not necessitated because you're a relative to rig it in favor of you, but it does provide a motivation. And so it makes the chance under the rigging hypothesis of you winning much more likely than it is on the chance hypothesis. So, uh, but now if you didn't have any relationship you could say, well, there was a motivating desire to do it for Tom Jump, but why a motivating desire for Tom Jump versus all the other possible individuals? Right. So, but what we were just talking about about simplicity and how we can eliminate the ex the ad hoc additions to the parts. If we look at the two comparison and say God is determined by His nature to, or highly probable by His nature or, to yeah, create more beings, motivated. highly motivated. So yeah, God is highly I'm motivated. I'm not even necessarily highly motivated. God just has a reason, a motivation. So, so the God person, exists and has some nature and is motivated to, to create value. a particular set of universes because of this morality. Why can't I just cut out that entirely and make the explanation simpler and just say pantheism has this particular nature to create this set of universes? But then Why the that, ad, that addition of morality seems totally ad hoc, like uh, using your example of the simplicity thing, we can just get rid of that completely and just say the necessary thing has this property which makes it create this range of universes. But then you just have, it's the same way as a lottery commissioner. There's no, it's an, arbit it's an arbitrary addition of the property. The case of goodness was motivated because of omniscience, because the character of goodness is that to recognize something as good motivates a being, which was the thesis to bring it the good about, um, and w the being would do that if um, bring about the good if there wasn't constraining um, desires um, or other constraining reasons. So it gives a reason to bring about the good. Um, you don't have that case with other properties. So if, if for example, theism will, it will not give a very good explanation of this at all. Let's suppose you find something really improbable, like you roll the die. Um, a hundred times in a row and it always comes, you know, it comes up six every time. And maybe it's, you could, as far as you could tell, it's a fair, or let's suppose, no, it, it doesn't come up six, it comes up just some random sequence. For any sequence that comes up a hundred times, it's going to be extremely improbable, right? It'd be six to the hundredth power. That's a very small number. One over six to the hundredth power. Someone could come along and say, well, God did it. But that's like, well, no one would be buy into that explanation because why would have God have the desire to produce that particular sequence versus all the others? Now, if you've been praying to God to produce that sequence and that would maybe raise its probability that God would do it, maybe not by very much, but it would, that would then it would actually support it a little bit. But the problem is you can arbitrarily assign that desire, God producing the sequence, and it's not going to do anything for you. So you'd have to have some non-arbitrary reason and um, for God having that desire, and I'm saying goodness provides that link. It's a non-arbitrary reason because to know the good, it, um, it, once you give God has knowledge and knows these moral truths, what's good, then you have a motive for doing it and it's not arbitrary anymore. So why can't I just say that there is this non-arbitrary property that's a part of the quantum states? It's just a part of Hilbert space or something, and it just forces it to make life the universe is more likely because of the way the laws are interconnected by these quantum states. Now, so that, there's, some, so there's, some, there's some interconnection among quantum states that makes the lottery commissioner happen to it, uh, that determines all the initial conditions. So it's a super determinism scenario. All the initial conditions, all the laws are determined. Let's do a Newtonian universe, just make it a little easier on us. And it determines... The lottery commissioner, just to have that brain state say, Tom Jump is going to win that million dollars. Um, so you could say that, but no one would think that was a very good explanation. Why? Because you think it, it just is improbable that that the universe would of necessity have that property as any of the 
to have the property to make the lottery commissioner say Robin Collins wins or, you know, whoever else played the lottery wins. Oh, but I said that it's necessary because it has this property of the quantum states, which is just determines it. So it can't be arbitrary. So this is not arbitrary either. It's um, not arbitrary that it's not metaphysically arbitrary, but it's epistemically arbitrary. We have no reason. We can give no argument to think that that is at all plausible, that that the commissioner would have that desire to do that. Um, no, no story to, that we could tell for that that's plausible. But it could be the case that of necessity, metaphysically, it's just necessary that it ha happens. So it's really the problem is in the epistemic probability, which drives the whole argument. So you could always invent something, but it would then be um, just as epistemically improbable as given what we know, not necessarily um, um, metaphysically. And, and it's the epistemic that counts, as you could see in the lottery commissioner case. So the, it seems like you're combining a uh, philosophical argument in with the physics, the fine tuning of the physics. Does it, is it fair to say that if you don't include the philosophical argument and you just go based off of the physics, like combinations of principles, particles, laws in the field of physics, that doesn't support design at all. It's only supported when you add the philosophical argument of like morality to yeah. the physics. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't think the fine tuning um, supports a generic design hypothesis. They're just some designer. I think if you just say some designer, that gives you no reason to think the designer would produce this kind of universes versus all others. Just like uh, um, in, uh, you know, any improbable event, if you, if you allow that, then any improbable event you could have supporting a design hypothesis. So no, I don't, I don't think that will work. I think it ha you have to have a reason that's somehow out of the, um, and not just simply ascribed to the nature, that comes out of something deeper in the nature of your postulate to, to um, think that the being would have the desire to create this sort of universe versus some other. So I would agree with that. So, so strictly speaking, pure physics on its own doesn't indicate design. It's only once you add the philosophical arguments like morality that indicates design. But if you reject those arguments, because I'm, I'm an atheist, so I would I reject the moral argument as being some fundamental part of reality. So if I would reject that argument, it would be unreasonable. You reject morality. Right, you reject morality. It would be unreasonable for me to come to the conclusion of a designer based purely on the physics, correct? If I reject all the philosophical arguments. Well, uh, on a probabilistic basis, um, not necessarily, as long as you grant there's some probability, some plausibility, you might reject, let's say, ethics and th think there's no ethical truth. But as long as you grant there's some plausibility, there's some small probability that those would be true. And then you say that link I talked about uh, has some small probability, then you're going to get maybe a quite small probability that if there's a God, that God would bring about this kind of universe, but it's going to be a much larger probability than the thing happening by chance. You still get confirmation just kind of on the likelihood principle. That you get a Bayesian confirmation, just like if you, you know, you were related, let's suppose there was a 5 billion people lottery. You were related to the lottery commissioner, but you were quite sure, you know, this is your brother after all. He's not corrupt. He wouldn't do something like this. You're quite sure he wouldn't do it. Yet it still should um, support that. You should t take that hypothesis more seriously after the evidence than you would before, because it still gives a lot of support for the hypothesis, just not enough to push you over because of your prior skepticism about the uh, character. Or you could do the same thing and fingerprints found on a gun, right? So the defendant is your brother and the fingerprints are found on the murder weapon. And um, you think that, you know, by chance, that's very improbable. And you're pretty sure the police department didn't rig it or anything. So, I mean, it could be somebody else had neuroidentical fingerprints. You think that's very improbable. But you also think that under the guilt hypothesis uh, it's, or the hypothesis your brother did it, that's also very improbable because your brother, it'd be very improbable for him to have the desire to do that. You think you know his character really well. But you still might get confirmation if the if if you know the fingerprints matched in enough ways to make it really unlikely. You know, it's something I learned from CSI. You have to they have to match they have to match pretty a lot of detailed ways, and so they could little bit match, not too improbable, match a lot, very improbable. 
Well, could I use the argument and say that whenever we apply the anthropomorphism of a designer to things, like throughout history, it's always failed. It's always been just some unknown natural thing that we've discovered yet or haven't discovered yet. So can't we just inductively conclude that this explanation is not a very good explanation, which would, even, which would lower the probability even more? Um, anthropomorphic gods are not good explanations, period, because they just push the fine-tuning back to who designed the anthropomorphic brain of the god. So they're not good. Uh, second, you shouldn't be giving arguments to explain the natural order of things um, with God. And in fact, it's sort of a myth that people, uh, d the classical theists, at least the theologians, philosophers, ever really did that. Um, uh, at least it was very minimal. Going way back to Augustine, um, like in the Christian tradition, um, it was always thought that God, most, almost everything was explained um, via natural laws. Miracles were didn't happen that um, often. So if you're going to explain something, you should invoke natural laws. It was unbecoming of a being like God to be poking around in the system all the time. So God would create a smoothly functioning system, a natural system. So it was only these other kind of polytheistic conceptions like Zeus or these, you know, like the ocean God or something that might have been used to explain events, and even that's not clear because often the ocean god was just a way of personalizing these forces of nature, so that's not even clear, but at best, that's the case. So first of all, I think it's a, a myth that happened very much at all, but second, for theism, it's not, the whole fine-tuning is not about explaining why the how nature works, why particular processes within nature works. Those you should always invoke um, natural laws if you can. And it's explaining the whole shebang, the universe as a whole. So the analogy is as science is like, science explains, it's like, or like, the, here's an analogy. We're like little creatures on an old, you know, old, all these an old style clock, you know, had those hands and gears and springs. We're like little creatures in that clock. And so if you were to ask us, well, um, how does the what causes the hands to move, those creatures would appeal not to some being outside the clock, but to the gears, the springs, etc., in the clock, right? And that'd be the, the thing to do. That would be what science does. But when it came to why there's a clock at all, analogy, why there's a universe at all with this structure, then that is the place where an explanation based on purpose becomes natural. And so it's not a god of the gaps. The god of the uh, the gaps would be the little creatures trying to explain why the hand moved in this way by saying, you know, the finger of God came down and pushed the hands that way. Um, but it wouldn't be a god of the gaps for them to come to the realization of saying, well, you know, our science won't explain why there's a clock there to begin with that. We have, a pur we have to appeal to purpose. So that, yeah, that's the kind of analogy. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that science is incapable of answering those fundamental questions about the metaphysical fundamental first principles of reality. But I believe the reason is because we don't have epistemic justification for any kinds of claims of the, that nature. And once we do, like science may eventually discover a way to answer that question. But right now, all of the problems that prevent science from being able to answer that question also seem to prevent all other areas of knowledge from preventing from answering that question. For example, in the moral question, like the uh, the G. E. Moore's open question argument and Hume's is ought distinction, those apply equally to philosophical explanations of objective morality as they do to theological explanations of objective morality. So it seems to rule out any justification of a basis of objective morality because we have those kinds of problems. Those kinds of problems exist in like every field of uh, mathematics and uh, Agrippa's trilemma, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, Tarski's indefinability theorem, uh, the problem of the criterion, the problem of the universals, uh, all kinds of problems in every field of knowledge that show we, we don't have justification for those metaphysical claims, which is why science doesn't make them, which is why I think Theology is also unjustified in making them. Um, so you're claiming unless something has a scientific um, explanation that um, it uh, it's we, we're not justified in believing it? I'm saying that we have big problems in every field of human knowledge that show we don't have a justification for metaphysical claims, and which they stop science from being able to make it, just like they stop everything from being able to make it. Well, um, it's not so much that stop. We might have justifications for making those claims. It's just that science works on 
we can't test them in a physical way in the sense of do our experiment. So there remains disagreement. So part of what happens in the scientific method is that um, you can go out and test the claim and do experiments that can then um, determine whether a theory is acceptable or not. Now, whether that theory is true is another huge question, a realism, anti-realism debate, but there's an implicit agreement in science if the theory works, then, and it passes the test, then goes goes with it. So we we it's a philosophical question whether the theory itself gives us knowledge about the world, and because there's a whole philosophical debate about that. So um, I would I would agree that it's a metaphysical question, but I don't think metaphysical questions lack justification. If you go that route, then you're going to have a problem of your very claim that metaphysical claims lack justification is also a claim that falls outside of science. And you're not going to be able to justify that either. So you've got a self-defeating situation. Well, I'd say that would be an epistemic claim. I'd say we don't have any epistemic means to justify metaphysical claims. But do we have then epistemic means of justifying epistemic claims? Well, yeah, that would be a tautology, yeah. So we have epistemic means of just, so you could justify those claims about metaphysical explanations don't, um, uh, uh, you can never be justified in metaphysical explanations. Yes, with the one exception of I think, therefore I am. That, that's my position. Yeah, what's your justification for this, that you can't have justification for metaphysical positions? We, I, I only say we can't have epistemic justification. We don't have a means of knowledge to justify metaphysical claims. How so I'm, I'm only making a claim about the current knowledge we have, the limited epistemic knowledge we have is like a ruler. We have a ruler. The ruler does not expand all the way across the universe. It just it fits in my hand right here. So this ruler cannot measure everything in the universe. It's just, it's just so the the science. If you say, well, we can't have, we don't have a scientific means of um, testing certain metaphysical claims. That's true, but that's all the facts you appeal to warrant. They don't warrant that we don't have um, that we don't have any justification for. We just don't have a scientific means of deciding between them. And I would agree with that. So it merges into a philosophical argument. All right, I would agree, but go further. I would say that the reasons the science can't do it is because of big problems in science, like the problem of induction, problem of underdetermination. We can't be certain that, like the, you said, the realist versus anti-realist debate in right. science. But I would go further than that and say the same kinds of problems exist in all philosophical areas of knowledge and every area of knowledge, every area of human knowledge, that prevent all of those kinds of areas from being able to justify those kinds of metaphysical claims about reality. So then what, 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 what does science give us about reality? I would go with something more like instrumentalism or phenomenalism. It gives us a description of an apparent reality, a kind of useful model that we can comprehend and interact with to our apparent minds, but not necessarily a description of reality itself. But even there, you're going to be, if you think there's a philosophical issue with induction, you're not even going to be able to say it gives us knowledge about the future. So it's not even going to be able to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. And you shouldn't, um, you, you, we just trust it because maybe on instinct or something, you're kind of taking a human position on this? Uh, sort of. I wrote my own epistemology. So my position is, is that, I start with, I think, therefore I am, and there's some difference between my imagination and my experience, and I need some way to differentiate between the two, and the one I go with is science. And right. so science just tells me the difference between my imagination and my experience, and if I can use it, then that's good enough. So I would, I would do trust induction insofar as that it makes useful predictions as far as I can tell. Now, does it actually make useful predictions? It makes no difference, because as far as I can tell, it does. That's all that matters to me. So you, you're, you justify induction by induction? Uh, not exactly, no. I don't just. So you just have a faith commitment in induction? No, I have a useful commitment to induction. Like I can say it's true. Like if I said it is apparent to me that I am holding a cup, I mean, that is metaphysically true because that's just what I'm appear to do to myself. But, but if it's it a useful me, one, you don't know it's useful because you have to use induction to say it's useful. Well, when even, I say, if you, even if you entrust your memory, you don't know it will continue being useful. Right. And when so, I when I mean when I say useful, I mean it's just true to my memory. That's all I mean by useful. So I don't true. mean useful as in it necessarily keeps me alive or it has some connection to the fundamental nature of reality. I just mean useful as in it appears to be the case to my mind. So like if I said I am apparently holding a cup, it appears to me as if I am holding a cup, that is useful to me. 
but it doesn't have to be true. It doesn't matter. The, the cup may not exist. We could be in the matrix. The cup may be an illusion, but it still appears to me as if I'm holding the cup. If I want to take a yeah. drink from the cup. Most, most claims of science have no phenomenology appearance to you. They're far beyond. I mean, you talk about molecules, atoms, you talk about, you know, Big Bang, all this stuff is far beyond anything we can ever experience. So you're trusting certain lines of reasoning that go far beyond any immediate experience. I mean, at best, you have somebody else's immediate experience in a laboratory, a long list of people writing things down. So I, I don't see how that epistemology is going to get you very far at all. Well, I still count that as indirect observation. So it still has some observation, which is then tied into some other things. And that's where the, how do I tell the difference between my imagination and my experience if it gives us those future predictions to get those right. things we see, even if they're just like numbers on a sheet of paper. That's still good enough to believe it's not one of the imaginary explanations. Right. Well, I don't want to go into a, a full, we could maybe do that some other day. I wouldn't mind coming back on this. So um, I, I actually promised my wife about a half hour ago i'd beat her for dinner so all right uh thanks for coming on i really enjoyed our conversation yeah it was good okay well if you want to do this uh some other topic again that's fine absolutely let me know absolutely. okay talk to you later all right so where is this is there a link to this uh yeah i can send you the link it's on my youtube channel i'll email you the link to it and do you have many people do you have usually um i usually get about a thousand views in a, like a week or so okay. i don't know it should say somewhere like 40 or 80 views. It's so it's actually on, it's actually on the, it's not just audio, it's visual too. Right. Okay. All right. Would you like me to send you the link? Yeah, go ahead and send me the link through email. All okay. Right. Good talking to you. Nice talking to you too. Talk to you okay. later. Bye. Bye.